Hello everyone, my name is Natasha Ryan and I'm the Education Officer at the Poetry Society and this is a video that has been produced for the Foyle Young Poets of the Year Award 2020 and I'm very pleased to be joined today by this year's judges of the award, Keith Jarrett and Maura Dooley and one of the Foyle patrons, Matt Abbott. So I'm just going to ask them to take a moment to introduce themselves. Uh, Maura, could we start with you? Hello, yes. Um, so I've been writing poetry um, sort of for as long as I can remember. And now I teach poetry and fiction at Goldsmith College and um, cram everything else around the edges of uh, managing to do that job. I live in London. I've also lived for quite some years in Yorkshire at one point in my life. And I grew up in Bristol in the West Country and still have a lot of family down there and in South Wales. Um, and my background family is in Ireland. Um, so that's somewhere that um, I visit a lot and love very much too. Brilliant, thank you. How about you, Keith? Hello, um, I'm Keith. I am, uh, I'm in London and it's a really beautiful sunny day. Um, I am, uh, yeah, I've been writing poetry again since I was really young because I was always encouraged to read and to just enjoy the sounds of, of language and playing with that as well. And also I think, um, you know, I grew up in a, in a family of a Caribbean heritage, Jamaican heritage, and I was always introduced to like such wonderful, like varied expressions and ways of putting words together. Um, and I think I've carried that through in my life and in my writing and then got involved in the performance scene and in slams um, when I was at university and so that was kind of my entry point into seeing myself as a as as a as a poet um, and so now I still do some performance and I also teach at um, university and in schools as well um, and so I really enjoy um, just bringing out um, poetry with young people as well. Oh, Natasha, can I just say something in there? Because it was something just that Keith said there about um, the sounds when you're growing up, you know, of your family and what they bring to you. And because both my parents had um, uh, South Walian accents, they grew up in Swansea, and we spent a lot of time going there. And then, like I was saying, over to Ireland, and their particular phrases, as well as the kind of way in which the accents change and are musical in different parts of the country. But their particular phrases, aren't they, that family uses? Um, and I think a lot of that also got into my head as a young person. And I, I love all that. And I love to, to try and use some of that in my poems. Yeah. yeah. I mean, do you, do you find a similar thing, Matt? Tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah. Um... So I actually sort of started writing poetry by accident when I was 17. Um, but I'd always loved quips and phrases. I'd always been obsessed with song, song lyrics. Um, my, my family were coal miners, so I was always into like storytelling. And, but I never really considered poetry. And I started writing it, like I said, by accident when I was 17. Um, I heard people do bits of poetry in between bands at a music night. And I sort of connected it with lyrics and I never even really realised it was poetry. Um, but I'd always been obsessed with the words and the quips and the language. Language. And I think that's really key because when I do poetry in schools now, I'm always up against it. People go, oh, poetry. And it's like, well, you like words, you like this, you like that, you like that. Well, you love poetry then. And so that's my passion when I go into schools is sort of bringing out the inner poets that a lot of students don't necessarily realise that they have. Um, I've been writing it since I was 17. I've been full time for like five years and I do a lot of gigs, but I really love doing teaching around the country. And like I say, I, I love uh, sort of coming out from an outsider's perspective, if you get what I mean. Yeah, great. All right, so I think that segues quite nicely into my first question, actually. So some of these questions have been submitted by our young poets and some of them have come from our team. Um, but just sort of drawing on what you've all just been saying, what, why did you really get into poetry? Was there a particular moment where you thought, I'm a poet now, or was it a more gradual process? <laughs> well, um... I don't think it kind of dawned on me in that way, really. I think it, it was just um, something that I fell into doing, you know, and I think like Matt was saying, music has a lot to do with it. So um, all the music that I tend to love, I love instrumentals, but actually mostly what I love is lyrics. So I'm always really interested in song lyrics. So that was part of it too. But also my mom and dad um, 
when they were at school, they learned a lot of poetry by heart. And um, so, and it just seemed like an ordinary part of their life. So like my dad and I used to, we, it was our job always to do the washing up on a Sunday. And um, he would, he probably had a drink at lunchtime too. And he would, you know, there'd always be a few songs and, and he'd recite some poems. Um, we wasn't reciting them, he would just say them. Um, so they sort of went into my head and it just seemed like quite a natural thing. So I think it just went from there really. Yeah. I think that's really important, isn't it? Just it being normalized, um, just to have, whether it's song lyrics or whatever, or even poetry being recited aloud, um, just that normalization um, that it's okay to enjoy poetry and then it allows that confidence of writing poetry. I think there was a one of John Agard's children's books, like that one of my siblings would read aloud to me. I remember like, repeat, I, I hope it was John Agard. <laughs> um, and, um, and just, yeah, just having that, like just having language a, a, around um, was just a really crucial part. So then when I began writing poetry, it wasn't anything exceptional. Um, yeah. It was something that I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so maybe if we can think a bit more about sort of how, how we read poems. Um, so I know Keith and Maura, you've just read an awful lot of poems as part of this year's Judging Round for the Foil Award. Um, and Matt, with going into schools a lot, you must read a lot of young people's poems um, on a daily basis, I would think. Um, so I'm just wondering, when, when you're reading a poem for the first time, is there anything in particular that sort of grabs your attention? Anything you look out for? Um, um, go for it. <laughs> Um, well, it can be all sorts of things is, is what I find. So sometimes it's the music of the poem, you know, it's the fact, I suppose maybe that ties back to what we were all saying about songwriting, but the sort of the lyric quality, you know, of phrases that just jumps out of you, sort of sings, sticks in your head in that way. Um, but for me also, it's always the particular, you know, so it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the detail of sort of what stuck under the car wheel, um, in the street, the cigarette butt, the old tin can, rather than just some rubbish in the gutter. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's all that sort of real uh, detail. That's what that's what always gets to me, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, that uh, absolutely the detail is what brings it to life. And I actually think that there's two really contrasting things that grab me. First of all, it's on my a word I've never thought about it like that the phrase is something that I never would have thought of phrase the phrase it in a way that I never would have thought of doing myself and then the other one is oh my word I know exactly what you mean and it's those the the, the it's the familiarity that pulls you out and it's the other world otherworldliness that you get from a poet where they phrase the world in a totally alien way that they're the two things that really excite me I know that sounds weird because we contrast but they both happen on the same line it's weird <laughs> yeah absolutely um, okay, um, so if we're thinking a bit more about sort of uh, what, what poetry can do um, for us as, as writers and as readers. Um, so obviously 2020 has been just, uh, an, well, as we know, an unprecedented year <laughs> um, with so much going on. Obviously the pandemic um, dominating, um, there's been the Black Lives Matter movement, um, there are the US elections coming up, so there's so much going on. Um, and I suppose it's made us wonder, um, you know, how far is poetry able to, or should poetry really go in and tackle those difficult subjects? Do you reckon, Keith, you're nodding. Um, <laughs> uh, could, it has to. Yeah. Sorry, I'll, I'll let Keith go. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, I was just simply saying, like, why should poetry not tackle those is my my main question, I think um, poetry can be about whatever <laughs> um, and it, we shouldn't have to limit it. Um, I think though sometimes when we're dealing with big important um, things, particularly that are happening right now, um, that sometimes it's it's easier to focus on the, the smaller things within that. Um, which make it more meaningful, more weighted. And, and I find also 
um, just going off what you were saying, Matt, earlier about surprise um, and being surprised by feeling at the same time, this is exactly, um, you've exactly put into words how I'm feeling at the same time as I never thought about it like that. Um, I think sometimes when we're dealing with big, important things, um, that it's it's even more um, it's even more valuable to 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 really just pay attention to the, the smaller details within that, um, and also the universal, um, and as well as the specific. Yeah. I think um, I think yeah. with with the big subjects, it's very easy to feel overwhelmed by them, to feel that it's so important and you want to say something about it, but but what you say kind of doesn't matter and, and that the thing itself seems so huge. And I think that's when a poem can be really important. It can just hone in on one tiny little thing, which, and that's perhaps where metaphor comes in as well, you know, some tiny thing which takes the measure um, and becomes the bigger picture and, and is often really very moving and important and powerful because of that. Um, and we've probably all seen examples over the last few years where um, a poem is, has been used um, in a campaign or it's been used in the newspapers to sum up what the media has found very difficult to get to in, in other ways bec because it's so important and because it's so huge and because we feel so small and in insignificant in the face of it, you know. So that's why I think poetry can be a fantastic force, yeah. yeah. I mean, because there's another kind yeah, of definitely. difficulty that we talk about with poetry, isn't there? So, you know, poetry can can tackle difficulty, but sometimes people can find poetry a bit difficult. And I know I've worked with a lot of young people who um, at first might freeze a little bit when they first see a poem or might think it a bit um, kind of impenetrable. So is there any advice you would have to them um, about that? Is, is it helpful to think of poetry as difficult? Sometimes I, I think that's <laughs> sorry. Go for it, I think it's part of a problem. I think it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think I think um, I think sometimes people have this perception that poetry is this really complex, um, like difficult thing, and so they almost think, "Oh, I don't understand poetry." Before they've actually tried to understand it, they're just like, "No, no, no." And I think it, so. It's it's like a self-fulfilling barrier that a lot of pupils just won't even look beyond. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd say also there, there are different ways of understanding something. Um, when I, you know, when I go out into the street, I'm not trying to understand what's happening immediately. I feel, and sometimes it's really useful, especially if you're studying poetry at school, um, where you're constantly looking for meaning and why has the writer chosen this? Um, when, I'm write, when I'm reading on my own, and I'm not necessarily looking for ideas or inspiration. I can read a poem, maybe not completely understand what is behind all of the metaphors, what's behind all the language, but I'll get a sense of feeling. And that is one way of understanding a poem, um, which is just as important as the, you know, the actual words themselves and what they mean and what's behind them. Um, and I think sometimes it can be intimidating looking at a poem and thinking, I can't deconstruct this right now. I think that's um, exactly right, Keith. And um, I think that the feeling side of it is so important. And that goes back to what we were all saying earlier, maybe about normalizing it. So I think that the more of it there is in unexpected places, the better, you know, which is why things like poetry on the underground is such a great scheme. But just in schools, you know, that, that you just have it up everywhere around the place, not kind of pretending to be a poem, but just stuff on the walls, <laughs> which happens to be poems that people see when they're not thinking about how difficult a poem is. They just read something and think, oh, I quite like that, or it moves them or interests them in some way. And I think we have to sort of try and do that, really, because unfortunately the way that sometimes sometimes it has to be taught in schools does put it in that category where it suddenly seems like a difficult thing you don't want to do you know so just have it everywhere and um, accessible I think. Yeah, absolutely um, so I wonder if we could think a bit more about sort of crafting a poem because um, I know a lot of young people um, have asked you know how important is is the form of the poem how important is the structure very important, not important at all, or does it depend on the poem? 
very much the latter, I'd say. Yeah. I, I find that when I'm starting to write a poem, I might try certain forms out. And if I feel like it's helping the poem along, then that's great. But sometimes it becomes a barrier. So you just have to learn to just ditch it. And just, you know, a poem's an idea that's somewhere in the in the universe, like in your imagination, and you're trying to sort of like make sense of it on the page. And yes, form is just one thing that helps you get there, I think, personally, but it, everyone's different, of course. Mm -hmm. I, I'd say the same thing. Um, I also think, um, uh, I don't, I mean, on the whole, I, I, I just, I, I don't particularly, I mean, I don't write sonnets, odes, uh, vanilles, etc. It's not the way I happen to write, but, um, I think it's quite fun to look at the forms as well, um, you know, in that way and, and see, if you, see if you can, first of all, sort of see how they work. And I don't mean in terms of sort of necessarily counting every syllable and, you know, but just having a look at them and thinking, oh, that's quite interesting, the way that that repeats there and that repeats there and that repeats there. And understanding kind of what that might do to the sort of music of the poem as much as anything else. So that can be good fun, I think. It, again, it needn't be a problem, you know. Um, and then sometimes there's certain kinds of writers who find they really love doing that and, and that's how they want to write. Um, and then other, others who don't. And I think all of it's fine, really. It just depends what sort of writer you are. Yeah, so we don't all have to feel the pressure to go away and write a Sestina. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. But it's quite nice to look at them and see how yeah. they work. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what about the sort of the editing process? I mean, as poets yourselves, how important is, is editing your work? Yeah. Vital. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know what, what I'm sure you feel the same, Matt and Keith, but I just think, it, you know, it never ends, actually, does it? There, there's a point at which you just think, I can't do any more with this now. I've been, you know, I've done, I've done sort of 30 different versions of it. Um, I think, but it does get better. It gets better and better um, if you edit it. It's, it's a lot of work and it seems a bit boring at first, but actually it has its own um, satisfaction and it, and it makes a much better much much better poem in the end yeah definitely knowing when to walk away can be difficult and that's when i sometimes impose those little rules on myself as the syllables or, or whatever but um sometimes you're in the mood for doodling and sometimes you're in the mood for sudoku and one's writing and one's editing and i just think you just have to go with where your head's at at the time but editing is just as important if not more like you say it's vital well, there, are, there are different ways in which you can approach editing as well. Um, and it's also useful just to put something away for a couple of days if you have that time and then come back to it. Um, yeah, so I have so many files <laughs> in my computer that I haven't touched for ages. And then the moment will come where I look at it again and I'm like, oh, wow, this is, you know, I'm, I really, I'm happy with this bit, but actually, what about these verbs? How am I going to change them around? Is there, you know, are there a few lines that are necessary? There are things that I find at the time of writing, I'm so like attached to, um, and I would never get rid of. But then a few days or weeks later on, it's not so important. And that line or the word just feels cheap. And you're like, actually, do you know what? <laughs> this isn't helping the poem. So I think time is a good editor as well. Mm. The classic kill your darlings advice. <laughs> yeah, I think that's really good advice. And I don't know if this happened to you, Matt and Keith, but the other funny thing I find about that is sometimes I put something away for so long that when I stumble upon it again, I can't, have, I can't remember having written it. <laughs> Yeah, I sort of looked yeah. at, oh, that's quite okay. <laughs> I'll have another go at it. And that's quite nice as well to find that you you can be a different sort of person in your poems. You know, you come back to something and it, and it feels almost like someone else wrote it. And that's quite a nice feeling, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely. Um, I think we've got time for probably one more question. Um, so which is just, um, if we're thinking about uh, young writers who have maybe entered the FOIL Award um, or who are maybe writing um, as part of the Young Poets Network, um, do you have any advice for young poets writing today? Well, I think my advice would be read, 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 you know, just read loads and loads of poems. Um, read poems from other countries, from other cultures, um, as well as your own where you happen to be. Um, yeah, just read and read and read and also never give up um, because um, 
sometimes it will seem like what you're writing isn't very interesting or you might enter a competition and it might not get anywhere or you you know you might give it to somebody and they don't really seem to like it very much just ignore all of that and just keep going and if it's important to you it will get better and better if you if you keep writing it will get better and better because practice like with anything makes things better you know but most of all enjoy it I think it's a wonderful thing to be involved in and yeah that's what I'd say I couldn't put that better myself. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just, like, just, you, you should really just write for yourself. Like, do, just trust your instincts. Read more, write more, trust your instincts. And if you're really happy with it, just go with it. Don't let anyone put you off. Because it's, you know, it's, it's one of the most precious things you can do, finding your voice. So let it be your voice. Brilliant. Well, what inspiring words to end on. Um, thank you so much. Um, and if you're a young poet or a teacher of a young poet, thank you so much for watching.